Okay, good morning, everybody. We will start. So welcome to today's uh, seminar in evolution and ecology of Montpellier. So as usual, for those of you who are online, you are in a webinar mode, which means that your mics and uh, videos are automatically switched off. If you have any technical issues, you can report them in using the chat. And of course, if you have questions to today's speaker, you can use the Q&A tab to ask your questions and uh, we will switch on your mic uh, to allow you to ask your question directly to, to the speaker. And with this, I give the floor to Juan Carlos to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Chi Hao Tie, uh, who is uh, currently professor at the National Taiwan University and uh, former director of the Institute of Oceanography in Taiwan. Uh, Zach has earned his PhD at the Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, and um, where he worked with one of the leading scientists in uh, the analysis uh, of a dynamic system, George Okihara. After his PhD, he made a postdoc in uh, Kyoto, University of Kyoto in Japan, and after since 2014, he's professor at the, or he was hired at National Taiwan University, where he continued working there. And we have Zach as a, uh, in a sabbatical visit, uh, hosted by Isem and Marbeck. And uh, among his main contributions of Zach, he has uh, published influential papers in fisheries oceanography, plankton ecology, uh, and in late years, he has focused in the development of analytical methods to uh, evaluate dynamic systems, dynamic nonlinear systems. So today, Zach will present the development of empirical dynamic models to understand and forecast uh, nonlinear dynamic systems. So please, Zach. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the webinar. Uh, Okay, is it okay now? All right, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, uh, Juan Carlo and uh, our cities for invitation uh, to allow me to come to uh, Montpellier for four for months. Uh, and also uh, uh, importantly, I'd like to, uh, uh, to thank you to uh, the MAKIT, the Montpellier Advanced Knowledge Institute on Transition. Uh, they provide a fellowship for me to stay here for four months. So I will be here until end of December. So today, uh, my talk will be more conceptual about EDM and then uh, uh, some application and interpretation how these tools work. I will not uh, explain the mathematics behind. I will not explain the detail of algorithms. Uh, but I, since I'll be here, if you are interested in the more details, uh, I'll be happy to uh, have more discussion. And next Tuesday, I'm going to give another talk in ESM for more technical part of the approach if you are interested. All right, so um, uh, let me start uh, with the... Uh, ah, okay. Is it, is it, is it time to wait? It's non-linear. Okay. okay, I'd like to start with the keyword today when I like to do the forecasting. So we are you know, people are doing this every day. So we have weather forecasting, right? So we are coming in the morning, we look at the iPhone and you know how good the weather is, or it's raining or not. So we're doing this, we experience this every day, right? And then I'm doing fisheries. For fisheries, we do stock assessment. I understand the status of stocks. And also we like to forecast for next year. So how many fish are allowed to catch and maintain the status of stock, right? So forecasting is important. If you are in the financial sector, you do stock market, so you like to forecast, right? For tomorrow, it's going to increase or decrease, right? Because of the how you make money, right? So right, every time when I talk about money, people start to pay attention to my talk. All right, um, so uh, how to do the forecast? So we learned this from our undergraduate theoretical ecology. 
Uh, this is a very simple uh, locked up Terra type of uh, uh, dynamics. So we, uh, if we understand the system perfectly, we can write down the equation, right? And then you can have a really good understanding. You can, uh, we call it mechanistic understanding. So you can do forecast, just understand already everything, all right? Certainly uh, real world is more complicated. Uh, so for example, in um, microbial species in our gut, there are thousands. We don't know how they interact, how, how to write the equation to interact not only with the species, interact with the chemicals, right? So it's very difficult to write down the equation. So the question is, you know, uh, how to decide the equations? Uh, it's difficult. Even uh, if you are doing very well, you can decide the equations. Then the question is you know, how to link the observation with the equations. So for most of the case, even though we know the equations, we have no idea about the parameters, right? We need to estimate, we need to do experiment, or we need to feed the data to get the parameters. However, if we have thousands of species, you know, how can we do, how, how, how to estimate parameters? It's getting the, uh, the challenging. So this is a particular, very challenging in biological systems, but I believe also are challenging in many other systems. So alternatively, uh, we can use the statistical modeling. We can do a regression, a correlation, and so on and so forth, right? Without mechanistical equations. However, uh, uh, correlation does not imply uh, causation. So uh, today I'd like to introduce an alternative approach called equation-free mechanistic forecasting. So this sentence contradictory itself, right? Because it's, Mechanistic forecasting, you have equation, but how can you be equation free? So that's something I like to you know, explain uh, today. All right, I have uh, many agendas. I see how far we can go. So first, uh, let's start with the detecting causality in complex system. So this is uh, Chinese. You, can, you don't understand, that's okay. We have a student from Taiwan, she can understand. So you uh, from Chuen, uh, you, okay, it's a uh, thousand years old. Uh, uh, like a very old uh, ch uh, Chinese wisdom. Uh, the explanation here is that uh, a halo around the moon indicates the rising of wind, the damp on place is a sign of approaching rain. That's a really nice form. Ah, right? <laughs> uh, so a halo around the moon has a good correlation with the wind, right? But there's no causality between the halo and the wind. We all understand this. This is not confusing at all. However, in a real world situation, we find many things that are correlated, not necessary, uh, has a causal relationship. Even worse, the Bishop Berkeley says, you know, correlation does not imply causation. This is a three, you know, three century uh, 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 years old uh, dictum. Uh, the, the even, worse, even worse situation is that it's conversely also true. The so lack of causal relation does not imply lack of causation. We can generate this uh, 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 time series data from COI model. So for a certain period of time, we find uh, the blue species and the red species that show very good positive correlation. Another period of time, they show a perfect, uh, almost perfect anti-correlation. And then for another period of time, they show very complex uh, uh, relationship, right? If you, are obtained, if you obtain this kind of data from field, you get confused, or at least I get confused, right? The correlation change in relationship to time. However, if you write down the equation, this is not so confusing. Uh, this data generated uh, with you know, a few seconds, this uh, two species coupled uh, discrete competition model. In this model, I, did not, I never changed the R or never changed the beta. I just choose arbitrarily the beta and R to make it either chaotic. So they have this kind of nonlinear uh, amicable behavior. So if you know the equation, this is not confusing, but if you don't know the equation, this can be confusing, right? But we know the two time series, they show no correlation if we do the very simple correlation analysis. However, they have causally related very obviously from the equation. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we, we uh, argue that uh, we can uh, adapt the following notation about cause and effect. So if the behavior of Y2 depending on, or if it's influenced by the state of Y1, then Y1 cos Y2. Uh, to do this, uh, let me introduce the like, concept of empirical dynamic modeling. So on your left-hand side, this is a Lorentz equation. So we have a, a, a nonlinear coupled uh, dynamic system, three differential equations, S, Y, Z. So this is a very simple model. You can generate a model, and then uh, uh, you can uh, generate a time series, right? 
So this is S, Y, and Z. So this is the black one. Sorry, this is a black line. This is a chuck, we call it a chapter. So this is Florence butterfly. So the time series data is just the, uh, 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 the projection of your chapter onto a time axis. So it projects S2 and Y or Z. Right? So the time series data we measured, in fact, is we, we, may, we make it through some kind of aggravation function so we can collect that data. So if you collect data X and Y and Z, you can plug that back to the three dimensional attractor, you can understand how the attractor change through time, right? So you have a perfect understanding. This is a mechanistic understanding. We all, we know, we all know this, right? So it's a perfect uh, condition. However, in a real world situation, we don't know the equation, okay? We don't know the attractor. Maybe we can collect only time series data from X. We cannot collect data from X and O, Y, or even worse, we don't even know what is X, what is Y. We can only collect data from X, all right? That's the, you know, Realistic. So how can you uh, uh, deal with that? Uh, uh, Tarkin theory says, if you can take the X, T as T minus tau and T minus two tau, okay? Again, I'm making that uh, reconstruction uh, called a state space reconstruction. We make it a shadow version of a tractor. This is now ST, S minus tau, S T minus tau, S T minus two tau. Okay, this is a, hold, uh, this is a, looks, a little bit similar like this, but not, not really, okay? But this, anyway, this ugly one is called the shorter version of a structure. But mathematically, this one and this one is a one-to-one mapping, okay? So the behavior, if you're understanding the behavior of this shorter version of a structure, you, then you can understand the behavior of this. And you can make a prediction, right? Because this is, again, deterministic. Now you can make a prediction. So now you're here, and they say here, you are here, and they say here, okay? So that's, allow you to make a prediction. Okay. Now I have a time series X, so I can make the shadow version of MX, right? It's one to one mapping with M. Although we don't know, we never know what is M, but we can pretending we have a one to one mapping. We can use the attractor, shadow version of attractor, actually attractor from X. Of course we can use Y, right? So now time series Y. So Y also have one to one mapping with M. X has one to one miss with M. Although we don't know, we never know M. However, if only if, if we can demonstrate the statistically, there's a one to one mapping between the MX and MY, if and only if they are causally related. Okay? So, so what we do is we develop an algorithm that demonstrates statistically they have a one to one mapping. Okay, I'm not going to explain the algorithm. If you are interested, we can do that Tuesday next week. All right. So, so we can do this, and then uh, the convergence is an important crit criteria for causality. The what I mean by convergence is that you have time series data and X and Y, right? So you can do the mapping. However, you need to increase the, during the algorithm, you need to increase the time series lens. When the time series lens is increased, the attractor become more clear because data are denser, then it make a better prediction, okay? It's not really prediction. And uh, uh, the correct wording is the cross mapping. Okay, I was just use the cross mapping. The cross mapping skill increase with the, your time series data lens. You can arbitrarily do some subsampling of your time series, and then you then need to demonstrate this convergence. Okay, so convergence is the, the important criteria for causality. So we have a cross mapping algorithm that makes sure it's convergent statistically. Then it's called a convergence cross mapping as a, a criteria for causality. Uh, uh, this is a specific design for nonlinear dynamical system. So um, I'm going to show two examples. One is a bidirectional uh, uh, causality, and then the unidirectional causality. So I have a Y1 and Y2. So if they are causally interacting, they should converge both sides, both directions. However, the strengths can be asymmetrical depending on the interaction coefficient beta. Okay. If beta is larger, then converge faster. If beta is smaller, converge slower. Okay, you can demonstrate it with a very simple toy model, right? So then you have a, uh, you can decide is a two-way convergence, okay? Uh, and then the strengths uh, depending on the, uh, 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 like the convergence uh, strengths uh, uh, determine the intention strengths. Uh, in the extreme case, Y1 cause Y2, but Y2 does not cause Y1. For example, Y1 can be temperature, Y2 can be fish abundance, okay? 
in this case, y1 inference on y2, we, we are able to use y2 cross map y1, okay? Because why this is called the importance of footprint because y1 inference y2. So y2 memorize the inference. So you, you are able to use y2 to predict y1. Okay, the correct word is, is a cross mapping. Okay. This is uh, very different from the Granger causality. Granger causality say y1 cause y2, you are able to use y1 predict y2. Okay. But Tarkins say the opposite. Tarkins say, Tarkins say if y1 cause y2, y2 predict y1. All right, because y1 cause y2, y1 memorize. So y1 cause y2, y1 memorize, y2 memorize y1. It's okay, <laughs> so I get a, a bit of mumbling in my mouth. All right, so this is a, a, a interesting case that's open course confusing, it's called a Moran effect. All right, so I, now I have a three variable, variable y is the uh, environment, okay? And I have two species, y1 and y2, right? So now environment inference y1 and environment also inference y2, but y1 and y2 do not interact. Okay, this is a very commonly observed that we know this is called the Moron effect, right? So, so under this condition, you will expect y1 can predict ye, y2 also can predict ye, but y1 and y2 does not predict each other. Okay, so we can very easily uh, demonstrate this using the uh, uh, two species model. This, uh, Two species model, they are uh, independent, two species, nonlinear. But however, they are influenced by the same environmental variable, T. Okay? So this is YE, like YE and Y1, Y2, right? So we can, this is a very simple model, we can generate time series data. So if you do the cross correlation between these two species, the cross correlation is significant. Okay, if you use a correlation as a criteria for causality, then you will say, Y1, Y2 are causally interacting, but they are not. Okay, the reason they have a good correlation because they are influenced by the same environmental variable. And if you use the CCM, you can see that there's no convergence. Okay, so we'll say Y1 and Y2 does not interact. Of course, they can predict environment, or cross map the environment. So I, uh, 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 speak about uh, this famous example of sardinia anchovies in California. So these are landing data from California. So for a certain period of time, uh, sardine is high, uh, then anchovy is low. And then another period of time, the anchovy is high, and sardine is low, and so on. So we have a, you know, so this is, you know, century old uh, 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 questions, you know, how to, why, why they have a, this uh, very good uh, anti uh, 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 correlation. There are two competing hypotheses. Hypothesis one is a species competition. You know, starting in HLV, living the similar size, living in the same environment, they're pelagic, they compete. So when one species is high, the other is low. Okay, the species interaction hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis is more wrong effect. So we know PDO, PDO is this kind of cycle, specific decadal oscillation. So people say, yeah, well, maybe past few, uh, say, well, in past few phase, starting prefer, Negative phase and to prefer, right? So there's a moral effect model. Okay? So the answer is already here, right? So you can see two species does not converge cross map and they can meet temperature, right? So environmental driving mechanism is the, 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 the key explanation why they have this kind of pattern. Of course, the temperature cannot meet the Maybe starting right because temperature cannot be influenced by fish. Right? So this is a, 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 a interesting uh, example uh, demonstrates demonstrating the uh, efficacy of this approach to uh, analyze the interesting uh, 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 ecological question. Now I'm going to uh, move a little bit uh, uh, more complex situation. Uh, we have many variables in the ecosystem. Now I'm going to construct larger network. Okay, let's we'll see how we can learn from this kind of approach. I, the objective here, I want to uh, convince you that warming destabilizes ecosystem by weakening biodiversity in the ecosystem. Uh, network. So we collect up data. Actually, the data is the, sub, the project is supported by CSAP here. Okay, many years ago. So we integrate the uh, global uh, data set from our aquatic systems. Uh, we have uh, uh, monthly data such as uh, 
phytoplankton plankton composition, biomass, the environmental uh, variable, and so on. So that's the data. And uh, uh, when we plot the warming rate, okay, calculated from temperature, and then the ecosystem stability, there's simply as a one over CV of a monthly phytoplankton total biomass. You may argue this may be not the best one, but this is the one we used. Um, so we find the interesting part, interesting negative relationship between one, between warming rate and the stability. This is kind of interesting, but you would say, well, maybe to an outlier. So we then took the global data set compared by other people. We do the same thing. So that data set uh, uh, from the uh, uh, phytoplankton biomass in many places. So this is for Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and there's some from our data set. It looks yeah, all negative. All right, overall course of the slope is different uh, because of the system is different. But anyway, there's a general negative relationship between only rate and the uh, ecosystem stability. And then we'll try to use a network approach uh, to explain why uh, we can only use the data set we have because they have more detailed data. So we uh, work uh, very hard to construct uh, the network for various systems. You can see some, uh, so, the, uh, so we have temperature, richness, phosphate, nitrate, uh, 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 biomass. Uh, the, the arrow indicate the, the causal relationship. And the thickness indicate uh, the strength of causality. So you can see in some, uh, some system, uh, very complicated interaction. And some system, you know, like this, with less uh, interaction. The network is less complex. So again, we are asking what determine the ecosystem stability. We uh, use the very classic uh, analysis that we calculate the richness for diversity. So it's a uh, very strange <laughs> increasing diversity, the stability reduced, but this, but this is not a good way to analyze this because the system are uh, very like all the uh, large entropic status and so on. Maybe this is not very complex, but I just want to show you. Yeah, if you do this classic analysis, it, it, it actually uh, contradictory to your uh, to our uh, expectation, and then uh, on this panel B, I use the linkage strengths. So this is a richness inference that is causally affecting phytoplankton biomass. So the ecological interpretation of this would be the turnover of species composition, change of diversity, how it be indicative of a turnover of that uh, 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 phytoplankton, and how they regulate the phytoplankton biomass. Okay, so this can be interpreted how biodiversity regulates phytoplankton biomass. So if your regulation is good, is strong, then system is stable. Okay, the regulation of biodiversity is not the status of the biodiversity, the regulation of biodiversity. And then if you incorporate the nutrient dynamics into that regulation, so now uh, 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 diversity regulated the nutrient, nutrient regulated phytoplankton biomass, and diversity also regulated, so this kind of slightly com 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 complex uh, regulation is strong, the system is more stable. Okay, as, com as opposed to if you only consider nutrient regulation, there are still some, some pattern, but that's not, not, not clear. That's as clear as this more complex uh, regulation to determine the uh, ecosystem stability. And then uh, we also found the uh, like, and the, with the increasing warming rate, the regulation weakened. Okay, maybe temperature or change of physiology or ecosystem dynamic and so on, they uh, reduce the uh, regulation, the ability for system to regulate itself. Okay, so that's the idea. And also we found the link combination is more sensitive to warming than the individual link. Okay, compare this to uh, figure. This is a more complex regulation. This is only considered biodiversity regulation. All right, so these are two examples about the CCM. So now I hope I convinced you uh, we can identify causal variables, but still how to decide equation and the parameters, or do we need to have equations? Certainly today I might try to argue that maybe we don't need the uh, equation here in some cases. I already explained, so, Temperature inference starting already, I already explained. I know, how, how, how can you move forward? You can say, maybe I can make it a equation incorporating 
uh, temperature as a covariate in the stock assessment model, and they predict the inference of temperature on, on the next year stock size. This already been done in California, but unfortunately not so successful. So this is a paper we published many years ago uh, showing the, how we can predict the climate effect on Pacific sardine. I'm going to use a tool called the multivariate EDM. So the how, could in, how to incorporate external stochastic forcing in state-based reconstruction. In fact, we can do a real-time simulation of external uh, environmental variable for short-term forecasting. I'll explain how we, how we can do this. This is very simple. So we have invariant embedding, for example, we can imagine this is all starting, it takes a time leg, time, time leg embedding, right? I already explained. So this one is called a multivariate embedding. We have a starting and temperature in the embedding. So now adding one more axis in the US state space reconstruction, including a temperature in your uh, reconstruction. Okay, so very intuitive. Uh, and then, so with this, we can incorporate the environmental forcing in your uh, our embedding. So idea very simple. So this is again a tractor. So I'm here. So next step, I'm expected to be here, right? Because this is deterministic. Now what I'm going to do for the scenarios for exploration is that I arbitrarily perturb the system. Say maybe I can increase 10% of the temperature or 0 0.1, 0 0.5 degree of temperature. There are many ways you can do this. So I'm a perturb the system. And then if the system is perturbed here, then should follow the trajectory to move here. Okay. So Originally, it should be like that, but now I perturb arbitrarily with zero consequence. All right, so that's the predicting climate change effect or environmental change effect on our state, our, our target variable. And I can do this for starting. Uh, so we have observation and the, 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 the output of algorithm. Now, now I'm going to just focus on like the full triangle, the arbitrary decrease temperature temperature and red triangle, the arbitrary increase temperature 10%. Okay, and we see what's, what's, what's the consequence. All right, so in some period, the, the inference is very small, but some periods inference is larger. On average, change, decreased temperature has a lower inference versus compared to the increase in temperature. So in, in, in California, we tend to believe uh, sardine prefer high temperature, right? Because I already showed you in the PD hall in the higher temperature domain, the sardine has higher abundance. So you expect increasing temperature always increase something, but it's not, okay, it's not. So the population increase or decrease is contest pending, okay? So it depends on, it de depends on the specific state of the population and the, or the ecosystem state. So we always have to monitor the system through time. So under the current condition, we can predict what's next state or increasing temperature or increasing precipitation or something like that. We also do this for mosquitoes or uh, to predict the potential donkey uh, 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 effects. But I don't pretend to talk about it. But you know, I think the key, key message is that the environmental impact, impact oops, sorry, environmental effect on your target population is always a contest. It's not a state. Okay, now I'm going to even more Complex. Now I have multi species. I have many species in the action. So I'm um, talking a little bit on that uh, how to quantify interaction. So this is a classic uh, experiment, right? So we put the two species in the cage. Maybe we have a cow, maybe we have a horse. They are competing for eating the grasses, and then we can measure them how fast they can eat. So in this case, the cow, the competition uh, is four times of a horse, right? So this is a, classic cage enclosure uh, is, right? if we want to understand the community interaction, we have to do this pairwise, right? However, even for this simple-minded approach, this is impractical for many species. You know, you've got the thousands of OTU. How can you do the pairwise competition or interaction experiment? It's impractical to do, right? And uh, even worse, the na nature system are more complex with many interacting species and changing environments. So the result of two species of competition may be different when you put the predator in, right? So the competition may be changed. And if more than many species, the pairwise result cannot be generalized to multiple species. Result that we already know that from many experiments, as you already go uh, study, right? And also the environment can be changing, right? The change of temperature or change the increase of precipitation also influence the, the interaction. Right? So this is neighbor state, again, not 
dating is a uh, challenging for us. So how to quantify many interactions through time? It's called time varying interaction. So I already explained, you know, you can identify who is interacting with whom. So this is already done. But then the interaction is not static, it changes through time. So that's something we need to figure out. So that's, uh, there's a method called the uh, multivariate SMAP uh, method. It's called native embedding. So we have species 2, C2, R, and the C1 is an example. You can imagine in a higher dimensional space, there are many species interacting. But this is an example. Now we construct that this is, this is not no longer leg embedding. These are real different species, like XYZ, right? We know, we know perfectly XYZ in this condition. Uh, and then this uh, gray line is the chapter. So this indicates the, the, uh, the dynamic of system. And then for, we can then follow the chapter, the trajectory of the chapter at each time point, we can evaluate the partial derivative, okay? And the partial derivative is a, a quantification of our interaction strengths. Again, we can do this for, for at each time point. For example, in this time point, the derivative is a very flat, right? Interaction is small. And in this time point, derivative, partial derivative is larger, so interaction is stronger. So the interaction, change it through time. And you can evaluate all the pairwise. Then you can come up with something we all know as the interaction Jacobian. So interaction Jacobian changes through time and then can, estimate, can be estimated from the chapter reconstruction push. Of course, there are some difficulty and limitation of the static, static point of view, but conceptually, if you're infinite amount of data, you should be able to do it reasonably well. So uh, we demonstrated this idea using the data from Japan. That's uh, uh, my friend, uh, Matsuda Sensei. Uh, he is a crazy scientist. Uh, every other week, he could uh, he do this uh, diving, and the visually count the swimming like that, <laughs> back and forth, and visually count different species. He did this for so many years, many many years. Okay. So this is why I say, you know, this a crazy uh, scientist uh, and then he then with all these nice fish, the picture he took, and then have this impressive time series data. Here I just show some, but he has many species. We just pick the species that consistently uh, present in that data set. Okay. So with this, did not do any study, I conclude Masuda Sensei, very healthy. So he can do it <laughs> scuba diving. <laughs> Every other week, you know, in Kyoto, in the Japan Sea, in the winter time, very cold. <laughs> but you can do this. But one day, you know, a few years ago, uh, we are in the Izakaya drinking, then he said, Oh, Zach, I'm getting old. Do you have any suggestion how to do this? You know, it's very tired, very cold in the winter time. And I think about for 30 seconds, and I say, Azura Sensei, Gabbate Kutasai, means please work harder. <laughs> And then, oh, this is, yeah, then he's, he's like, <laughs> and of course, now he, he has a student, uh, you know, postdoc, and uh, they get assistant, take time to do this. He no longer, he also do, but still do, but he no longer do everything by himself. But still, the impressive time series data continue, still even today, as, my, as far as my understanding, continue, very high impressive. So now we have data. Now with SMAP, you can construct time very interaction, right? And then with that, that approach with the Jacobian matrix, we can calculate the eigenvalue. So everybody understand this. So this is called the local diopolymer stability. It should be instability because the large, large eigenvalue means it is more unstable. Okay. So then you can then ask, you know, how the diversity and network party influence on system stability and so on. So this is a classic uh, theoretical ecological uh, question we can ask uh, 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 using this kind of data and approach. So these are uh, uh, time series of uh, interactions, structure 18, and a bit, uh, very clear serenity, this is not surprising, but still uh, interannual variability is large. And then you, if you, you know, collapse all the data, you can see on average species have a negative correlation, <laughs> a negative interaction, and some species have a positive interaction. But keep in mind, the sign and the strength of interaction are not are time variant, okay? So it's not a state structure, not state. And then uh, we also uh, look into this uh, uh, stability questions. Uh, again, this is a convergent cross mapping figure. So 
I don't, I'm not going to into detail. Basically, you find the mean interaction strength has a mixed effect on stability. And weaker, weaker interaction leads to more stable dynamic community dynamics, and diversity contributes to stable uh, community dynamics. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the approach uh, to estimate the time bearing interaction given time series data. Uh, I, say, I repeated uh, many times that the interaction network is dynamical, not the static. And this, uh, hopefully, this can help uh, to, for the multi species uh, management of fisheries. So I show you this kind of strategy where many uh, we can construct the Jacobian uh, metrics through time and change the dynamic network and but how large your network can be is this approach. Okay, so we have a, again in the guts thousands of OTU. Okay, in the ocean, thousands of OTU or bacteria. So how can you do that? And it's actually uh, technically uh, challenging because of the body again we need to make it embed in high dimensional space. So suppose you have a 100 species, you're embedding like 100, it's not possible, right? Because not every species interact with other species all the time. And some species are redundant in the sense that it does not has a similar uh, uh, effect in the dynamics. So maybe I just, for example, in a system, maybe we have 100 species, in fact, the embedding dimension is only 10, okay? The real world, real world attractor is not the dimension of real attractor is much less, usually much less than the number of species. Okay, but how can you do? Because when you try to calculate the Jacobian, you need to put them in the one, your 100 species, you need to put them in 100 dimension. Then, but then if you do this, you have a, you have a typical problem on this medical uh, uh, called curse of dimensionality. You cannot do the correct uh, uh, estimation of the Jacobian. Okay, so this is a, a, a challenging. So uh, we resolve this problem, it's impossible to read it. <laughs> I don't expect that you can read it. It's, um, the idea is that uh, we develop a method called the MDRS map, multi-view distance regularized S map. That is that we uh, make a many ensemble embedding in the embedding dimension E, maybe low embedding, okay, correct embedding, we can estimate. And then we are using this recursive curve, recursive function, uh, using the sparse regression, that can, with the, with the, with the, with the uh, regularization, we can then estimate all the problem. Okay, and the algorithm as I explained in the paper and the code are available. I'm not going, I'm not going to go in detail. It just happened to believe me that we do a good job. <laughs> so, uh, but to demonstrate that I can uh, generate the model, right? We can use the same with the simulate the many, many high dimensional, like thousand species model. And in the, in the end, the many species and then pass down, and then we just pick some dominant species. Okay. This is just uh, some example. And then because it is, and then we can have a time series data. With the time series data, we are using our approach to construct a Jacobian. And because this is model, we know the exact answer, and we can then make a comparison. If, we, if this comparison is good, we can then use the model, we can then use the FMAP, construct the network to analyze some network topology, or network stability, all right? So like a, a trace of Jacobian or dominant eigenvalue and so on, which are well known. So without showing all the statistic uh, algorithm, I'm just give you some example, it's a randomly chosen. We are one 10,000 time step. Okay, we can do this Jacobian estimation for every time point. I just randomly pick some, uh, some, some numbers. So this is a, a time 970. Okay, this is 980, you can choose 960. They are all almost the same, it's similar. So this is a theoretical interaction strength. So this is a, this is a model, right? This is a, we know that it's correct answer. So these are correct answer. So these are estimated from its map. Okay, and then that reasonably okay. Of course, there are some not good, and I don't know why. <laughs> this is something we have to work on, but uh, okay. okay. And then we can check the topology, uh, property, and many other things. They are all really, really, really good. Okay, in the paper you can read. So now I'm going to try the approach using the time series data, like the uh, bacteria time series data uh, collected by MIT group. The totally uh, uh, about 140 uh, OTU uh, time series density is 90. So actually, you can see there are more number of species than <laughs> time points, but still you can do. So this is just some 
animation. <laughs> I don't know what I mean. Uh, so there are different uh, species. I am not a QR guy. We have no idea what I mean. But anyway, you can do this, do this kind of thing. So we can identify the key species by analyzing the, the network property, like hub or uh, our, 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 our strength and so on. Okay, we identify human species. We didn't go very far because we're not microbiologists, but then this gives you some hint how we can move from here. We also do some classic things to analyze this uh, network topology. Uh, we find uh, uh, the increase, increasing new resource, increasing silicate, we see increasing profile A, so the resource of bacteria, then the uh, mean interaction strength increase. Okay. We also found the increasing channel diversity, uh, the instability decrease, which means increasing diversity, stability increase. Not the super good, but there's some tendency. Uh, this one is obvious. This is the disturbance from fresh water because of precipitation. So this is a coastal site. When you have a, a, a fresh water coming in, salinity reduce, the system is not stable. This is not surprising uh, because it is an ocean uh, system. Right? But at least with this kind of approach, uh, we can uh, try, to try to analyze this kind of uh, uh, issues. And uh, importantly, we can analyze how this kind of changes through time. This is the final topic, the early warning signal. Uh, Everybody understand this. I don't. I don't think I need to explain. The important need are uh, the anticipating the occurrence, the timing of occurrence, uh, and the, the type of critical transition. This is a, this is a for the catastrophe, right? This is for the fabrication. But we know there are other type of period doubling fabrication, or the NS fabrication, or different type of fabrication. Real world situation, of course, this is. We often see this, but in fact, there are other types of fabrication also important to identify as early warning signal. Okay, so ideally, you want to propose the idea to quantify the resilience. We want to have some approach complement to the existing uh, idea. Uh, so we know that the rising variance, uh, uh, rising correlation, flickering, and so on. There are many experts here in Montpellier uh, make an excellent work of all, all these things. So I don't think I need to explain. Uh, but I feel that at least the two challenges remain. One is the threshold. Beyond what number, there will be a fabrication. Are you rising increase, rising variance of, of course, yeah, yeah, but until we expect the fabrication to occur. Right, and also type of fabrication. So we we'll always pay attention to four catastrophe, but real world situation. There are many, there are three, at least three types. There's the material, there are three types of fabrication that we need to be able to uh, distinguish the type of fabrication. Uh, for uh, many important applications. So this is a fabrication theory from its basic point of view. We know the three types of fabrication for the period doubling uh, NS fabrication, and we can uh, distinguish them. If we have an equation and we evaluate the equilibrium condition, and then we calculate the eigenvalue and we analyze eigenvalue in the complex plane, then we can distinguish. So this is a well known, right? From that uh, ODE uh, class, we learn this. But this approach requires the governing equation. And so we general case, we, we don't know a governing equation. But as I already explained, with the time series data, with the EDM, we are able to estimate hope. But we, even we don't have an equation, we have some, something available to allow you to calculate the eigenvalue and determine the type of vibration. So that's the idea. So given time series data, so suppose I have a, I have a multivariate time series data, I'm going to calculate the hope I for k one. However, in real world, again, in real world situation, we don't know, you know all these species. However, we can still, we can use the Tartan theory, we can take a leg, univariate, again, they take FT, as T minus one, T minus two, and so on. The proper leg, they will recover the dynamics. Right, so you have, is it in, is it embedded the time series, calculate Jacobian. We don't know the ecological meaning of this element of Jacobian because we don't know other species. However, the eigenvalue is invariant. We can still calculate the eigenvalue, even if we don't know other species, All right? So that, that happens, and many other people prove this uh, 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 approach. So given the time series data, we are moving with the moving window, following the uh, uh, mountain shovel approach, we have a moving window, but of course the question is how to decide window, these are all statistical issues. But anyway, just that we can do that. 
right? We can do the moving window and we got the Jacobian, we got eigenvalue, we got a complex plane. Okay, so the quantitative threshold is one. It's already known, right? It's one, it's discrete system. The discrete system, the, 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 the quest threshold is one. So approaching one means you're approaching by position, right? And then you can distinguish type of transition in a complex plane, right? So this is some model. Example, this is a famous model. We have a, a folder, we have a period doubling of the NS fabrication. So there's a variable that we can simulate that we added the statisticity. Okay, and then we turn in the fabrication parameter, is typically done, right? And then we can then calculate the moving window DV. So this is a fabrication, and this is fabrication. So this is one. Okay, and the approach one is fabrication. So very clear. It's a very, very simple model. But some are nonlinear increasing with some students that are supposed to talk about this with me. I have no idea how it is nonlinear, something like this is something open much. But anyway, you can see how they approach one. That's the US target. But of course, we need to be proportionary, right? Because there's noise anyway. You know, the target is one. And then we can distinguish from complex point which type of application. Okay, it's almost come to the end. So then we try this in the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, facilities, we work on various data set. Uh, so these are uh, uh, cyanobacteria microplasma experiments. This made a very famous one by Mark, by Mark Shaver group. And this, uh, I think this must be the PhD thesis. This is a climate time series. And then we also have a vocal, so vocal time series. And this is uh, uh, electricity from power uh, plant uh, electricity data. And this is a uh, Mitochondria under O2 stress. Again, because this already happened, we know exactly the publication occurred. Right? You can see that from this uh, uh, figure. Right? But the idea is that can we anticipate them using the DV approach? Okay, and the, can we distinguish type of application by looking at the DV, by looking at the eigenvalue at the complex point? Right? This is not working perfectly, but at least uh, you know, it's okay. Yeah, you can see indeed before publication, your DV is approaching one, and then you can distinguish the type of application using this type of EDF approach. Okay, that's uh, some tech home message. So, I, so we need a carefully designed monitoring program to collect long-term time series data. Now, because of the eDNA and many other automatic imaging and AI, it has become more and more feasible. So you can collect uh, continuous uh, time series data. And then uh, hopefully the EDM provide a useful framework for analyzing our nonlinear dynamic system. So we have a package. So you can, if you Google our IDM, you can download the package. Uh, we have a, a tutorial paper. This is a very simple tutorial paper. Explain the concept. Also have a practice code. You can just you know follow. I say you can do. But it's up to 2017. But as you say, as you can, uh, you know, know the notice the many papers published afterwards. So there's a more recent review paper by Steve Munch. So this is a recent development, okay? And all the paper, all the method, all the paper, methodology paper will publish it with the code in the supplement, so you can try. So uh, of course there are limitations of the approach. So they cannot deal with the real Tesla because they need, need the time series data. Real Tesla has too many zeros, it's impossible to embed the zeros. So this is a big uh, limitation that we cannot deal with the real Tesla. And then we need the, uh, Time series substantial amount of data. Okay, that's the limitation. And so far, we cannot deal with cross scale interaction. And some forward looking, so multivariate DV, you know, you have many species, you have to do a DV for many species, but this is, in reality, this is much more complicated than I, than we, we can expect to put it on species to DV. It's now, it does not work like that. Okay, it does not work like that. I can't say that. And then also for further publication, for further publication, you know, it's done, then it's finished. But for period doubling publication, you have publication, and publication, and publication, right? So we can, we can anticipate the first one, the threshold is one, but afterward, there's many publications. We don't know how to do that. It's something, uh, and also maybe integrate machine learning or, uh, and also for the network, we have the network structure through time, and there could be many interesting uh, topics around this uh, uh, data, uh, this, uh, Know, data from SNAP. Uh, also, we are trying to bridge in the time series data with uh, more mathematical theory for nonlinear dynamic system. And other things that we show you, we don't have a mathematical proof. Okay. And then uh, also some application beyond ecology, like uh, 
I'm working on this brain brain uh, dynamics or heart rate ECG time series. There's something uh, we also uh, uh, work on. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, so there is, uh, we can open the, the discussion. So your questions are welcome. Yes. Thank you. I had uh, a question related maybe to uh, what you mentioned by uh, cross-scale interaction, because I was wondering whether everything is based on the fact that causation is defined by uh, one species having an effect at time t on the other species at time t or t plus one, but if it has an effect that is delayed, can you also, yeah, it, can uh, you also the, do yeah, it? Uh, so with the CCM, CCM is a determined causality integrate for a period of time. So if the things what happened, as you said, then the CCM will detect. And you can have a, also lake the CCM, so time delay the CCM to sh shift a little bit the time index. So you can yeah. see that the delayed the causality. So that's possible. But the more difficult thing is that the, the species do not interact with other species all the time, right? Because that uh, uh, at every time point, the interaction is now is, is not stated. So with this question, you can use SMAP because SMAP will give you the result of the network structure changes through time. Is that answer your question? Okay. But this is not the, not really cross scale because it is a scale that depending on the time interval we decide every month, every week, so on. When I say cross scale, it means that there's something slower, something has a you know decadal scale, but a change in the consequence of the daily scale of bacteria. This is called cross scale. Actually, this is more challenging. Please. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a, I find it very interesting. Uh, thank you for showing all this. Um, one question is about the, the correlations you show when it's uh, when you apply this to, uh, to to real data. So often the correlations you show are are they exist? They're significant, but they are quite weak, and there's lots of uh, uh, there's a lot of variance. It isn't explained by uh, like if you put Shannon diversity ability. So, 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 in, in this approach? Yes, uh, something I didn't explain uh, is this uh, lake data. Um, so, we are very interested in BF, uh, biodiversity effect on ecosystem functioning. So, for given time, each, each, each data set, we have a biodiversity time series changes through time. We also have a copy of concentration changes through time. So if you make a regression between between uh, diversity versus uh, crop year, and you have a moving window, you can see the relationship change a lot. Okay, even in a given system, there's no static uh, relationship between for BF. Okay, this is structure. Okay, that's something I, I like to make first. Second, now we propose using the link strengths to explain the diversity. What we have not done, which we should be, which we are which I'm doing now, is that uh, you have a S map, right? You have many species, okay? And then you can do analogously, you can see I have a uh, biodiversity time series, I have a temperature time series, I have many, many time series or something. And I have a stability time series. Okay, I have a productivity time series. Then we are going to use the S map approach. Then we, you can generate the ecosystem network because it's state, state variable ecosystem. A network and see the changes so far. Then you can see, yeah, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. You can then try to understand why, under what kind, what kind of condition, biodiversity improves the uh, 
uh, functioning, but some other, other condition temperature is more important. It's not dy it's dynamic, but I agree with you, it's possible to do. And then that, that's something we are doing now, uh, not the main project I'm doing in this month of year. Uh, Super interesting, but lots of things I didn't understand. But um, so, so, for instance, in this, um, it's because it was very dense, so it was. Um, but like um, this fluctuating interaction strength, intuitively, I would think that you will never get enough power to estimate. Um, you know uh, that all these interaction parameters that they all. Uh, so do you, do you get with this approach or uh, advocating that's even equation free, etc. Can you get some insights as to how you get the power to estimate things? I mean, how come you're able to estimate um, temporally fluctuating interaction strength among all these species? That seems almost magic to me. <laughs> you yeah, see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I'm not a specialist on that, but I just feel it's, there's lots of things yeah. to estimate there. So. Yeah, the concept is explained in this figure. So these are three species, but you can imagine the mathematical you can do in the higher dimension is that we, in every time point, so this is not data is not dense, but uh, supposedly we have a lot of data. So the data is dense. Okay, then at this point we can talk about the, the slope of the the, the, the curve, the curve. Okay, and lots of that the So we can always estimate. But of course, as you said, if the data is not dense. So it, the, yeah. And dense in the sense that you need to explore different combinations of densities, I guess, of the no, different species. No, dense means I have a lot of data. Yeah, but in addition to that, if, if, if you have lots of data, but you, it just happens that you also, I mean, to me, to be able to estimate fluctuating interaction strength between different species, you need to have combination of there's population abundances of these different species that are very different. Yes. Otherwise, you will yeah, never so be able to say that. Yeah, so the, and, yes, you need a time series data for many species. Yeah, and, and that they're not very strongly correlated and always behaving in a kind of stereotypical way where they're interacting. Yeah, if everybody correlated, then it's a linear system. Right? It's not, it's not yeah, that's the extreme. But yeah, be, be, before going there, there are a lot of cases where it seems to me very uh, difficult that you'll be able to estimate fluctuations in interactions trend between many species, unless they're undergoing very complex dynamics where uh, you see what I mean? You don't see yeah. them. Yeah, so, so the general assumption is that we believe the, the ecosystem is complex. The interaction is not static. This is more like chaotic system. This approach is developed the specific for chaotic system. If the system is linear, then it's better to use a multivariate uh, AR model that's proposed by other people, like Granger and so on. If the system is stochastic and uh, linear, then the linear approach is applied. And if the system is nonlinear, then this, this work uh, better. And then, uh, uh, as you said, uh, there are many species, not how we develop. There are some algorithms we develop that, that, that come for what you just uh, ask. Yeah, maybe not very good. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at the yeah, paper. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Thanks. Yeah. But as I said, it's enormous, there's enormous medical proof. We are just trying the simulation and then working okay. But there are, well, there are cases that does not work very well. If you have a really highly nonlinear, complex, like host parasite restraint, I shouldn't say strange, if some very nonlinear complex system, then the estimation difficulty is reduced. But for local material, weaker type, uh, these are generally working slightly better. It was working very well, but overall, it's somewhat underestimated, is what you found, right? Yes, it's also is it is 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 a is a uh, uh, not always not underestimated. No, this sorry, the slope is. Yeah, slope is always one. positive, right? Because it is a this is a theoretical mm -hmm. result resolve the which so they always positive and always highly significant. The the true answer in the experiment. Uh, this is always true for every for any high point. But we have more difficulty to estimate the very weak interaction. Yeah. I it's related to what he uh, so um Another way to to say this is like how, how are you sure that you explore the whole attractor, like the volume that you're exploring? If your data is just a very small fraction no, no, the, the, of the, the attractor, idea is that it doesn't, the, it doesn't the, really the matter. The fundamental assumption of this approach is that time series lens is longer enough to explore majority mm. of the 
a, a different uh, uh, talk harder over the chapter. Right. Of course, we know a chapter is always hierarchical. You, when you use body part, it's also in a higher, longer scale, it's higher, 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 the chapter is embedded. But certainly, the interpretation is limited by the data itself mm -hmm. and limited by how much the data tries to the different portion of the chapter. If we, uh, if we, you, you have very short time to data, then all this approach can now work. So in that case, could you use some space for time substitutions? Yes, you can. Yeah, so there are already other paper with it already, the algorithm already published by other groups, by, by other Adam Clark and other people here. Uh, David Heeman, they also have a different uh, algorithm. But the basic it is not so difficult, you just stick all the space. You still need a time to space, huh? but you don't need that very long. But now you do many space as a duplicate, and then there are some technical issues all the time, but uh, that this already developed. In this case, that you can only predict something that has already happened. You moved within the um, the attractor, right? So does that mean that when you and go within temperature that have already been spanned? Yes, exactly. We cannot uh, understand, say, if in the future there's 50 degree of temperature. We don't know because we never see it in history. That's right. Thank you. No more questions? Okay. Thank you. Hello,